The U.S. Department of Labor says the economy added only 210,000 jobs last month. New numbers out today also show the national unemployment rate fell to 4.2 percent. Now, these figures come as businesses across the country recover from the coronavirus pandemic. At least we hope they're recovering. Mark Hamrick joins me now. He's a senior economic analyst at Bankrate to explain what these numbers mean, Mark. Because when I first read the numbers, I was like, oh, that's that's good. But apparently it's not that great. Um, what are November's numbers telling us about the current state of the economy? Good morning, Anne-Marie. Well, I think, first of all, we get some uh, contradictory signs in this report, as you indicate. Uh, and there's, I want to say, almost something for everybody in this report, depending on which side of the fence they're falling on, whether they want to take a positive or negative spin. But uh, I look at the fact that in recent months, we've had head fakes before with the shortfalls and the payroll gains. This comes from the establishment survey or the survey of businesses. The household survey tells a different story that's more positive, and that's how in the household survey, you got that decline in the unemployment rate to 4.2%. We think about the fact that the unemployment Employment rate got close to 15% during the worst of the pandemic induced recession, uh, and that we were as low as 3.5% in February of last year. So we're getting closer to that. But as with so many aspects of the pandemic and the economy these days, uh, we will occasionally uh, face sort of a one step forward and one step sideways situation. And I think that's what we're getting in this report, which beyond the payrolls number or around it is largely positive. Wage gains were up, labor force participation. Uh, uh, is on the rise. So uh, there are some positives in this report, as well as that shortfall that you mentioned. Why do you think, though, economists had predicted many more jobs? What were the factors that they were seeing that they thought would indicate, you know, double the amount of jobs? Well, let's remember, first of all, these reports uh, are revised on a regular basis, and we got upward revisions in the previous two months in this report, as we have in other recent months. This report may end up being more positive than the way it looks this morning. Uh, economists were looking at the fact that coming into this report, we were adding on the order of 582,000 jobs a month, and now that average settles back down a little bit to 555,000. Elsewhere, we've seen positive indications uh, that includes the weekly jobless claims that uh, we've been watching recently. They've moved down to pandemic era lows. And of course, in the previous read, we're at the lowest level in 52 years. The ADP report earlier this week, which is another measure of private payrolls, quite positive. And we know that the problem out there is not a shortage of available jobs. The problem is a shortage of available workers. And that theme, I think, will be with us, okay. along with obviously other uh, issues, including inflation and supply chain disruptions. And that brings me to my next question. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce conducted a recent poll where they found 53 percent of Americans who became unemployed during the pandemic say that they're only somewhat active or not very active at all when it comes to looking for a job. Uh, you know, why do you think that is? I mean, people are not getting, you know, the PPP money and stuff that they were getting before, but they don't seem that eager to get back into the workforce. Well, there's a host of reasons, and I don't normally look to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce as a source of uh, data uh, in terms of surveying the American public. Uh, but I think that, you know, we've been talking about these issues for quite some time. Our own bank rate survey uh, earlier this fall indicated that people are prioritizing uh, workplace flexibility, which includes hours worked as well as the opportunity to work remote, over compensation. And compensation is at higher levels than what we have seen uh, historically. Obviously, we're still dealing with the pandemic. The latest drain doesn't help. We had a high level of retirees. Uh, and uh, there's still this issue of daycare where we're still short daycare providers, which is why the Biden administration is put shining a light on this issue of uh, the lack of fed man federally mandated family leave. So uh, I think, you know, this is all part of a normalization process that we're going to still have to work through balancing supply and demand with jobs that are available with the supply of workers and the demand for goods, uh, as well as the supply chain disruptions. It all kind of fits together, even though it's a bit of a puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, well, as you know, the Biden administration has really been a championing, championing the uh, infrastructure bill as a way to inject lots of money into the economy. Uh, the vice president was uh, in North Carolina yesterday talking about that very thing. 
What do you hope comes out of this infrastructure bill in terms of its impact on the economy? Because the thing about it is these are really like long term projects. You know, uh, you got you plan a bridge. You're not going to suddenly employ people tomorrow. It's going to be over a long period of time. That's right. And uh, you haven't had people really uh, ratcheting up their forecast for GDP in the near term by significant uh, margins because this is a long term consideration. And, you know, the joke here in Washington, I'm just outside the Beltway, as you can tell, working from home, but the joke in Washington and elsewhere has been for years that it's infrastructure week. And now that's finally arrived. And we're reminded of the need for this funding every time we go out on the road, right, and see the potholes uh, or the bridges that you're looking at and saying, oh, that looks a little rusty. Uh, so this is investment in the long term in a town where we just kicked the can down to February in terms of government funding. So, uh, you know, this seems to have been the uh, something outside the norm in the sense of a, a look at the long term, which has been sorely needed. And whether it's investment in, uh, let's say, broadband, which we know many communities across the country have been left behind with that and therefore not able to uh, do what they needed to accomplish during this pandemic, we We've really brought forward a lot of innovation during the pandemic, which is a wonderful thing, along with the miserable and heartbreaking aspects of the pandemic. And the infrastructure funding will help to keep that going and pay attention to things that have been uh, not getting the love they needed for many years now. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, as you know, there's been a lot of talk of inflation, and that's directly connected to how people feel about the economy. Sometimes it's not even what they're actually experiencing. It's just how they feel, consumer confidence. I want to get your take on the type of inflation that we're seeing now. Um, I know it's connected to the pandemic. I know it's connected to, um, you know, the inability for people to, to get what the things that they need. Um, but do you see it as something that is specific to certain products? And so as a result, we're feeling it. You want to buy a car. You can't get the, the chip that you need. So your car's delayed. Or do you see the inflation as something that's more widespread and may be lingering with us for a while? I think it's quite widespread, and I think that's why it's showing up in the measures of consumer confidence, particularly the University of Michigan survey. Uh, and I think that, you know, we think about the fact that the pandemic really exacerbated wealth and income inequality. Plenty of people have done well during the pandemic, particularly those of us fortunate to work home, work at home uh, and to keep our jobs. But for those who uh, were not as fortunate or may have lost their jobs, remember, we lost 22 million jobs in March and April of last year. So on the question of inflation, it is is quite broad based. And we just simply don't know how persistent it's going to be. I think that as Chairman Powell has said um, multiple times uh, in his job as uh, leading the Federal Reserve, this is a time for humility. But uh, the level of inflation and the persistence of it has been one of the unwelcome surprises of this time. And that, by the way, is again exacerbating income and wealth inequality, which uh, is, is a high concern. And I think that this is a risk uh, for 2022. It could take um, negative impacts on consumer spending, uh, because if you have to pay for important things like food uh, and transportation, uh, which are showing up, obviously, uh, in some of this data, that's negative. We are seeing some positive signs, though, Anne-Marie, whether it's the decline in commodities prices, including the cost of crude oil, which should begin to uh, show up at the gasoline pump. And some of the supply chain disruptions are showing some positive signs of being uh, resolved. Whether those are more meaningful remains to be seen, much the same as the uncertainty that's associated with, with this latest COVID-19 variant. Right. Well, Mark Hamrick, glad that we have you here today to go through all the numbers with us and explain it as you see it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.